and uh, welcome to the next lesson and in this lesson we're going to be talking about some generalized concepts. It's going to be uh, the first lesson where we really start kicking things into uh, higher gear in the sense where uh, the videos are going to be a little bit longer, a little bit more diverse when it comes to information and um, well they will require a little more time investment than the previous videos that are really only like 45 minutes to an hour long. Occasionally, I would go a little bit more than that, but not uh, not all the time. And so, this brings me to just the the the, the first kind of discussion that I want to have, and this is really to do with. Uh, so we talked about weak side, right? We talked about weak side, strong side, and we talked about weak side, strong side in the first video, right? So this is like lesson one. You can go over weak side, strong side. Um, the video that was basically talking about weak side strong side talked a lot about something called cross map plays or we can call it investments right um or whatever you want to call it so for, for the sake of this uh, video for the sake of the lesson we're going to call it investments we're going to call it or over or, or we'll just call it like cross map plays um and so essentially what the game becomes is a game of evening out weight all right, and when I say evening out weight, I mean in the sense where, let's say we, essentially, what we want to do is we want to split the map into two portions here, okay? So we split the map into two portions. Uh, we can call it top, uh, bottom side, top side, left side, right side, whatever you want to term it. But generally, <clears throat> there will be a strong side and weak side, right? And so because, you know, let's say you have a winning top, you have a losing bottom, well, your strong side is now top side, your weak side is now bottom side, um, and vice versa. And so... When we look at this idea of a of a split, uh, just cutting the map in half, right, just like this, what's gonna end up happening a lot of times in higher ranking gameplay, what you're gonna notice is players tend to. So let's say that you know a general transition in the jungle is like okay, well let's say you're playing from blue side, your jungle from blue side, you know, starts from A, you know, he does whatever route, he ends up in B. Very basic stuff, right? Right, very standard uh, ending a clear. Um, and eventually, in some variation, he'll he'll end up ganking top lane, right? Um, now, if the opposing jungler knows the gank is coming, because this this gank in itself, th this is telegraphed, right? Like this makes sense. Anytime that a gank happens, usually people know it's coming. Usually, you'll know it's coming, um, just based on the variable of like lane states, right? So the first one is lane states. Um, and the second variable of uh, jungle positioning, right? Like where is the jungle uh, positioning himself on the map. And in this case, if we <clears throat> term it in the in the sense of, okay, well, he starts A and then he ends B, and then we know that he ganks topside. Let's say this is a, a very foreseen uh, gank that ends up happening. Usually what's going to happen is now, well, the opposing jungler has to even out the gold value because this gank, assuming it's a successful gank, will, let's say this gives you net so 300 gold for the kill, uh, maybe 150 for the assist, plus perhaps another, like let's say, uh, let's say another 100 gold, let's say, um, or let's even say like any, anywhere between like 50 to like 80 gold plus, because you know, let's say the wave is pushing out, because there, there's usually going to be a, um, a minion wave loss in some degree every time a successful gank ends up happening. Mainly because, uh, well, the opposing enemy laner is not going to, he's dead, right? He's either dead or he's forced out of the lane. And so, which or, or you know, he's flashed or something, and so he can't really walk up. And so what ends up happening is he, he's losing a net value, right? And so we can, we can call this value, right? So this is the value. We can just term this value as uh, value x, okay? Let's just call this x for now. So when x ends up happening, okay? Sorry, I'm going to try to write it a little bit neater. But when X ends up happening, as jungle goes from A to position B to ganking top, what is up happening is there's a there's an uneven distribution in which team is ahead. So if the gank works out, well, now the blue side team is ahead of the red side team, right? Because the gank just worked out. Now, the trade-off to this is that the blue side team has responded, which means that, well, jungle has shown his intention, the play is over. They're not going to chain a play on the other side of the map. And so what ends up happening all of a sudden is now the 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 opposite side of the map 
is left in a weakened state, which in this case, you know, uh, you know, as enemy jungle maybe goes A, goes B, you know, um, or perhaps he doesn't go A and, he, and he, he just starts off from B and then realizes that, you know, there's no point in going A because he's going to lose his jungle anyway because this is possible. Um, and so then he cross maps to B, right? So he, he will cross map to B. Um, and so what you'll quickly find is that the higher levels of League of Legends you play, this X that was essentially uh, gained for blue side has to be evened out by a cross map play. So if the cross map play ends up happening, then we assume that X is relatively equal to Y. Right? Obviously, there's some fluctuations, right? Because you know, kills will be, you know, unevenly distributed. Uh, bot lane has more players, you know, towers, etc. There's obviously some variations, but the, but the point is, you're evening out the uh, the play, and you're able to do this because you know there's no response. And so, what ends up happening when you do this is you start generating an even game. So in this case, for the red side team, this uh, this play here the gank into bottom lane, which is a response to top showing, is really just a play to even out the game, to keep the game in even standing, and so, which essentially means in this case is, bot lane is now strong side for the red side, and top lane is now strong side for the blue side. In many cases, what ends up happening now is, well, let's say that strong side is in the same lane for both teams so there's strong side bottom and strong side um enemy bottom <clears throat> okay for example because usually that's how game goes uh usually when bottom lane ends up doing really poorly the game can be a little bit obnoxious to play in solo queue generally it's because there's just more players down there um and, and hence you know impact but what ends up happening then is this even distribution of x equals y where you know you make an x play and so you then get a Y return by making a play on the opposite side, may not exist because both junglers are pathing to the same lane, and so someone has to win, right? There has to be one winner and one loser to some degree. Now, obviously, if one team assesses the fact that this play is bad for us and will lose, then they make the cross play, okay? That's when you give up tower. Let's say a, a very good example is, like, let's say um, this position is happening where you're both playing strong side bottom, but you realize that you've already lost. And so what ends up happening is you immediately shift momentum to the other side of the lane to try to keep an even game going, which generally means that uh, your ADC, although not favorable, is having to give up the wave. Support is moving. Um, jungle is moving top. But you're shifting momentum to the other side of the lane. Okay? And this is based on what jungle essentially wants to do. Now, the problem is sometimes... Now, this can get a bit tricky, right? is if you follow this concept of, well, I must even out the game. And so if I gain a value in X, if I if I gain X value in top, I must gain Y value in bottom. This may not always be, like, although the game value is equal, it may actually not be. Now, the reason why it may not be is because context is involved, right? Context, which means that if you're ganking for, let's say, a Malphite, Let's say, for example, that your bottom lane gets ganked and you're jungling in your top side. So, and so what you do is you counter it with a response. So obviously a response could... This is a viable response. Okay? Um, but this isn't a viable response if... Because th th this play can win the game. Taking this jungle in itself without chaining it to a different play may not be enough to even out the advantages that the opposing jungler, assuming again you're playing from the blue side perspective, is able to get through through Y. Likewise, another example would be is if the cross map play, if Y ends up occurring and you there's something you can do, and you attempt to, you know, you follow it up with a with a with an even play or a cross map play, um, and so you you know you attempt to do X, what you'll find out quickly is that certain champions don't really require you to be there and so by investing in them you're not really going to be winning the game it's in the same sense where let's say in the bottom lane draven gets a kill and then in top lane you make a cross map play and then malphite gets a kill and malphite goes ahead he bases and he builds armor right he builds some mr or whatever he has some move speed right i mean this stuff is not going to win you the game not in solo queue at least Right, Draven comes back, he has like 
he has like half of the infinity edge already completed. And so this can open up the game. And so even if you attempt to cross map a weak side, it may not even out. Now, if you substitute Malphite for, let's say, Fiora, let's say Aatrox, right? Let's say Quinn, something that can explode the game, then you, you are gaining a little more value. But you have to realize that when you make a cross map play, not necessarily a cross map play, but when you when you, when you attempt to go for a gank, the thing is every time you gank a lane, you're actually hurting another lane indirectly. That's something that jungle just has to, that's that's the very characteristic of jungles, right? Um, and this is one of the reasons why junglers get flamed a lot, because laners don't understand junglers so uh, like uh their uh role. And so anytime you really gank a lane in some indirect way you are hurting mid and, and, and bottom if let's say you gank top because what you've done is you've showed yourself you you've invested you've made a response or not a response but you but you've made a play and so that play now is, is is going to be responded to but you can't compensate for the response and the response is going to be felt through mid and the response will be felt through bottom now obviously like it depends right like who's winning Right? If mid is pushing in, you know, it's different. If mid has wards, it's different. If bottom lane gives up um, tower or like bottom lane gets a solo kill too, it's like this random stuff can happen. But the general idea is that if you have invested a play in Y, let's say top side, then a cross map play must be invested into X. And what this cross map play allows you to do, it lets you stay even in the game. However, if you cross map play within the wrong context, then you can still fall behind. If you cross map play in a way that's not as impactful as the first play, where again, we talked about how enemy jungle can dive bottom and now your bottom lane's dead. But then what you do, what your team does is, you know, you take these camps and then you cross map here. Okay, well, it's not as effective as as, as, as killing the enemy bottom lane. Okay, maybe you get Shelly, right? Like that's possible. If you get Shelly and then you cross and then you cross it with a top play, and then you get more value here. Okay, well you got value. For, you you have gold from these. You get gold from this. You get gold from the kill if you do get the kill, and, and you know, and you and you have Shelly, because you're you're getting the plates and stuff, right? And so perhaps to some degree, yes, you can um, you can you can even it out, but it has to be like not just counter jungling when your bottom lane gets dove and honestly as a player you'll eventually be able to assess if something is able to outweigh uh, a specific play so you can you can be able to assess okay well they just killed two of my teammates in bottom just counter jungling isn't really going to win us the game um but sometimes there's something you can do and so what you'll find is when you climb the ladder Especially at the top of Challenger, people really start losing games based on like draft, and and this stuff really does start affecting you. Okay, so this was just a general explanation of uh, some really basic theory, and so now let's let's move into the actual gameplay. Okay, uh, let's quickly discuss the VOD with respect to the idea of the same concepts we were discussing earlier, the strong side weak side. Um, we were we you know we move into X so. Enemy team does a play, X very, uh, X amount of gold is uh, the lead, and then in, in uh, response, Y is then done. Which in this case, again, in this context would be a cross map play. Um, so while we're doing that, we'll obviously briefly talk about the uh, Nico Ari matchup as well, since, you know, that's what we're watching. Um, so let's quickly talk about this. Here goes Stretch Raptors. Enemy jungle. Hard to tell where he starts considering Scion shows. So we assume that bot lane is leashing, but they aren't because bot lane also shows. So now really there's three ways to assess how the pace of the game will be played out. Okay. The first way is through jungle location, right? Like where does enemy jungle start? You can look at mana, you can look at HP. Obviously this is a professional game, so, um, you know, you may not just be able to do that and get away with it, um, but in a in solo queue definitely you can. And again, these videos, the the educational perspective I'm giving you is based on solo queue. And of course, we're only looking at pro play because 
you know, when it comes to an, uh, again an educational perspective, it doesn't really matter. You know, the game is still the same game, but I want you to be aware that the screen we're looking at is a professional game. Um, but we will talk and think in terms of solo queue. Okay. So the uh, the first way you can assess how the game will be played out is jungle location opening to see you know who's coming late to lane. The second thing um, is you can look at draft logic, right? Uh, and draft logic is essentially okay. Well, weak side, strong side. Don't want to invest in a weak side lane, and therefore investments for the enemy should be on a strong side lane, and therefore we can assess where jungle will start, and you know you can you can then play it out. And so when we look at the logic in, in this context, we're gonna quickly realize that investing into a scion into a Cassante is not really going to be a good use of the opponent jungler time. And so most likely starting on the top side would be the most optimal thing and ending on the bottom side would be the most optimal thing. So draft logic usually is about like 80% of the time correct. It does require some game knowledge and prior understanding of the game, um, which not every player has in the beginning. So it's not a big deal if you don't, if you aren't able to do this immediately, but usually it's like 80% accuracy in solo queue. Um, the lower elo you go, the pro probably it's like less because more random things get. Um, but that's okay, because then obviously you can still use the first assessment, which is looking at the jungle HP and mana, or laner XP and mana, sorry. Um, and now, finally, the third thing is looking at wards, so ward placements, right? Now, this is again more a test, more akin to higher level gameplay, because usually in the higher levels, people are actually warding and then hugging towards those sides. Uh, with the intention to play on a on a strong side position, right? Whether it be the right or the left side of the of the lane here, um, and obviously th this unfortunately loses accuracy the lower level you go in solo queue because people again the the more random things get, the 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 less these uh, these theories are entirely accurate. Okay, uh, I apologize. That was my phone. I'm just gonna go ahead and mute that while I'm doing this. And so, anyways. Going back to um, what I was saying, is you can assess the opening of the game in these three ways, really. The jungle location, or uh, in the sense where laners, who is coming late to lane, mana HP, right? So I guess I'll write that down as well. Mana HP, right? Um, draft logic, which again requires a little bit of prior awareness. And lastly, wards. And so we'll we'll talk about all of these things as, as we play the bot. So Viego starts Raptors, which means that his Raptors will be on a respawn, which will be the, like the quickest respawn, right? Like that'll be the first camp that respawns on the second rotation of Viga, uh, not Viga, sorry, Viego's uh, clear. And notice what um, Scout does here. So let's let's open and and see like what what Scout's opening here is in the lane, right? So we have jungle opening, and now we want to look at lane opening. So in this scenario. It doesn't look like LNG is really looking for anything too crazy, and so it's a very standard opening where jungle is just starting uh, Raptors, and well, Ari is just really pacing away from the um, minions because we're not going to allow the mid laner on the side of RNG. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce his name. Um, we're not going to allow the Nico. We're, we're going to refer to him as Nico and Ari for now. Okay, um, I may refer to Ari as Scout time to time, so just be aware. Um, so. In this regard, we're going to stay away from the wave because we don't want to allow Nico to get the push in the lane and also get the HP advantage on us by, by hitting us with a Q. Right? And Q is very strong level one. Okay? And so that's why we pace away from our minions, right? We want to stay in a, in a relatively good distance. We don't want to stay here. That's bad because then we end up losing uh, double value, right? We'll end up uh, we'll, lo we'll lose our HP and we'll lose minion push as well. Now, in this lane, we're probably not going to get push. And the reason we're not going to get push is because Nico is already in front of the wave and just hitting all the minions. And, and Scout is really spaced away. And as you notice, what Nico is doing is she's actually changing the range of Q. And so what you're going to notice is that she's spacing in between these two locations. And so, again, I mentioned A and B. Right? So notice what Nico is going to do here. She's moving up and down A and B. And what essentially this is really doing is it's moving the range of Q like up and down, up and down, over and over again, and this is in order to land a max range Q onto Scout, okay? You do this in lower elo and you're gonna hit people like crazy. In in uh, 
in a professional game in Challenger with Challenger players, not in Challenger, but in a professional game with Challenger players uh, and pro players, you're not going to be able to just hit them every single time with an ability. But in low elo, you can literally like you know you could throw it anywhere and you'll you'll end up you know your skill shot will end up finding them somehow. So, anyways, Nico's uh, on Q cooldown. Ari responds with another Q to get the minion. The purpose, the main goal, the main objective in this regard on the perspective of both scout and also the nico is to just simply get the minions and then to find appropriate recall timers scout moves up and this is only because nico's on q cooldown and so as you can see when nico is off of q cooldown and she has q up you're going to notice that his position is again a lot more into a defensive position again this is a lot more upwards this is like you're going to see scout stand here when nico's q is on cooldown and then when Nico's Q is not on cooldown, you're going to notice that Scout's going to be a little more back, all right? Goes for the... Uh, okay, so interesting enough, he uh, Nico actually misses Q. And now because Nico misses Q, we ask ourselves, right, like, what does Nico want? And we talked about this. Like, what are the three things we're looking at lane, right? We're looking at this, we're looking at our lane opponent, and we're looking at the map. And this is all discussed in prior lessons. And so when Nico obviously you know, whiffs her Q, doesn't end up getting us, we end up getting a minion. We know that she wants this minion here because this minion is about to die. Which means that for her to get this minion, she has to position somewhere here, somewhere here, somewhere here, somewhere here. Okay? Now obviously she's not gonna be able to be on the north side of the lane because it's too far away. Okay? And so because we've assessed that her only two pockets are A and B, then we stand in relation to A and B, which could be this, it could be this, it could be this. And the goal is to simply throw out the Q and try to hit her. Okay? So we missed the Q, that's okay. And then we immediately back off. And the reason we back off, again, we talked about this, is because Nico's on Q cooldown. Uh, sorry, she's off of Q cooldown. It means that it's up. Nico goes ahead and places the word, and so now when this word ends up happening, we assess uh, a few things in our minds, right? The first thing we've assessed is that, okay, well, both laners actually started relatively, uh, they, they showed up at the same time, like, you know, re relatively the same time. Um, now, using our understanding of draft logic is, well, investment in topside isn't really valuable. And so, most likely, an end opening for the opposing jungler should be onto the bottom side. If they opened... If they open bottom and then ended up pathing to top, they're not really going to find much value in top lane. Because if they find value in top, if they find an attempt in top lane, it's going to cross play to the bottom side of the map, um, which could actually hurt the side of what is it RNG? Because Scion doesn't require an initial investment in order to win the game, and this is very akin to solo queue. And so now, through the idea of draft logic, we know that jungle is most likely bottom and now the ward that Nico places is a complete telltale that definitely enemy jungle is pathing to the bottom side and the reason for that is because Nico's going to be hovering to the bottom side of the lane we have priority in bottom and so what's going to end up happening if this priority in both of the lanes in mid and bottom continue to stay the way they are then Viego is going to have to play accordingly he's not going to be able to play inside the river he's going to have to avoid if a potential uh, invade ends up happening and so what's going to happen then is Viego has to cross and, and and go to the other side of the jungle and then if he's going to go for a um a crab, it'll have to be on the top side with the intent of Kasante having push into Scion. So in this case, when, when you're the top laner and you notice that your team is playing like this and there's nothing you can do, then you want to attempt to get top prio because you know that you're you're in a pretty safe state. You have the ward. It's unlikely that you're going to get ganked, but you need to give your jungle some breathing room to grab the crab in top side. And if you have the ability to push, then you should definitely exercise such. Okay? At this point in the game, the ideal play for Nico would be to be able to hopefully... No so, I ideally what you want to do is you want to keep these minions alive because you have a slow push going on. You want to stack the third wave and then shove the whole thing into them, which will allow you to find a base timer. If you find a base timer, what ends up happening is you essentially get first blood indirectly on the, fifth, uh, on the fourth and the fifth wave because waves are coming into you and you know that you're not really required to be in the river because it's unlikely that the enemy team will play for the river considering bot lane will retain prio under that assumption 
okay? Now, if you can't find this indirect first blood on fourth and fifth wave because you're shoving in the second wave, then, well, you know, shove the second wave and then just double down on your efforts in, in the sense where you harass them under tower um, and then, you know, you, you play for, not the top side, but you just, you just play for whatever's happening in the river. And you, and you just keep landing, really, okay? Alternatively, what is happening then is if the minion wave allows you, you can shove the third wave and then also get a base off. But if the cannon wave on your third wave ends up dying too fast, then you can't really base because the base requires 10 seconds. And then it requires another 30 seconds to get back into the lane. And so what's going to happen within the crashing of the third wave in that regard is, well, Ari will have first move on the fourth wave, which is not going to be a good call for you in the in the perspective of Nico. We'll talk about this in a, in a bit as, as the game goes forward. Um, again, Nico uses a Q. Now, I don't really understand why bone plating is the is the pick here for Scout. Mainly considering that uh, I, I understand that bone plating is valuable if Nico's going to full combo him, right? Because the Nico will use the E and then to the full combo, etc. Um, but I don't think that she'll full combo with Ari having bone plating when bone plating is easily procked with Q. And so the idea of going bone plating, I don't necessarily see the logic behind it. I see what Scout is thinking, but I don't think that it's a... I don't see the logic behind it. So, of course, maybe in chat you guys can, you know, debate amongst yourselves or whatever. Or you can just ask me in DMs um, about, you know, bone plating inside this matchup. Which I, I don't think it's very good. Okay, uh, I'm not going to talk about every little movement, okay? Because that's exhausting. We're just CSing under tower. Vigo does blue, places the ward in the river, goes to wolves. And now Nico just wants to shove the third wave. And if she is able to third shove the third wave, see, if she kills off all of these minions and then eats the REQ, let's say she eats REQ and kills off these minions, she literally runs here in bases, and then that's okay, right? Um, but if she does this too late and this, this tower starts whacking on the cannon wave, or the cannon minion, then uh, what's going to happen is the third wave will be obliterated way too fast by the time Nico is still in base, and now Ari will have first move on the fourth wave, so that's what I was talking about. So you have to be very specific with your base timers um, and, your, and your, uh, your, your, like when you shut off the wave. We've assessed that enemy jungle should be bottom. Nico ends up staying. Scout misses the cannon. A little unfortunate, but it's okay. And now Viego does red buff. And all we're doing as Scout is we're just trying to space the uh, the Nico and get it getting like making sure we're getting all the minions. And again, we want to address that, okay, well if anything's gonna happen, it's most likely gonna be in bottom lane, right? Like that's the only lane that Wukong, um, which is the enemy jungle here, could actually go for. Um, but obviously, if enemy bottom lane is full HP, it's not happening, right? But you want to be aware that enemy jungle can, can do something there. As the side of... Uh, what is this team? LNG. I don't really watch uh, much pro play these days. Attempts to finesse the charm there. Doesn't find it. Dodges the uh, Nico stun. And as you can see, Viego. So as you can see, Wukong ends up showing, right? Like he showed up earlier. <clears throat> um, and so Wukong, after showing, shouldn't really be able to do anything. We want to position ourselves to the to the north hand side of the lane here. We we never want to be down here. That's really scary, right? Because um, if we get stunned, then we have to flash. Um, and so, meanwhile, being aware of bottom lane, Wukong, okay, so Viego uses the plant, wards the Grom, and then goes straight to his respawn. We talked about the Raptors respawning first. And so now Wukong has really two options, right? Wukong has two options. The first option, and, and this is, again, stuff that you can start thinking about while you're playing mid lane or top lane or, you know, bottom lane as well. Because now you know what you're doing as a laner if you know what's going on in the game. Wukong can do one of two things. He can... The first, which is the better option, which is the more consistent option, which is most likely what's going to happen, is he's just going to base and he's going to run to topside and you'll see him on the ground spot. 
okay? The alternative, the latter, which could happen, is he attempts to force something on the bottom side, and then what ends up happening is, you know, then either this guy bases or he invades, right? Like, depending on whether he bases now or he bases, um, like, later if Wukong presses. Um, but, but it does depend, and, you'll, and you're, you're going to see it in a second. So he only has two options. Okay, so Wukong ends up showing bottom lane. So if Wukong hadn't showed in bottom lane, we're not going to make a move like this. Because this will spawn soon. Okay? If Wukong hadn't done this, we would have based, and Wukong would end up showing here very soon. At this point, we don't really have any push. Get the cannon scout, nice. DMATS. The minion in the bottom, very good. Vega ends up eating the Gromp. <clears throat> um, and Wukong at this point should look to base. Right, like, if Wukong isn't on our Gromp, like, if Wukong's on our Gromp, that's really dangerous, by the way. That's a bad call. Because there's no priority. So Wukong should base. But you can assess like, okay, well the pings are going off on the Gromp, which means that the possibility of Wukong trading off the Gromp for the Gromp is there, but unlikely considering it's a very suicidal um, attempt to, to, to go for the Gromp, right? All right, so TPing back, gets the last chapter. Wukong should not have taken Gromp as he doesn't is most likely on the wolves, or he ended up pathing to the raptors. Most likely is on the wolves, because I don't see why he would path to raptors here. He's just gonna misalign his camps. And again, at this point, we wanna be aware that Kazante should have a good lane state with respect to where Wukong is. And you, you'll notice that this isn't even really me talking about the Ari into the Nico. What the hell is that guy doing? Okay, so that was weird. I don't know what that was. Uh, I think he wanted to give him cannon, but he didn't have a stack. I, I don't know what that was, but anyways, whatever. Um, so notice I'm not even really talking about the lane. I'm talking about what is happening in the game. Because this is the, the primary concept of the video is to go over like weak side, strong side. Wukong is here, by the way. So, okay, this is not a 2v2. Going for this play is a bad idea. You're going to notice in a second that Wukong will show up. Now, I haven't seen this video, okay? I haven't watched it up until now. I only watched it up until the, um, like, the crap, right? Um, and then, obviously, I, I've recorded it for the, for, the, for the talk that I'm having around the video. But this is a bad idea because wukong hasn't shown topside he's definitely here this is not a 2v2 and this is a scenario that you run into solo queue very often when you make a player your jungler calls for something and then you realize that it's actually not a 2v2 or not a 3v3 and someone else shows up right but if wukong shows up here it's very obvious like wukong is around raptors and so let's see what ends up happening okay so they call off the play they call off the fight which is good. Now, the only reason I'm saying I'm talking about the fight is because someone is pinging to go for this. But going for this fight means losing the game because your Rakan is not in position, nor is the Aphilios, and Wukong is probably around uh, or behind the Nautilus, and it's just not worth. Diego does uh, the Dragon because we have priority, and at this point, as a mid laner, we want to attempt to also hold as much priority and so again when i say we need priority is what i mean is don't try to freeze when your dragon when your jungler is doing dragon and enemy jungle is literally right here the only reason jungle uh jungle our viego can actually do dragon is because we have priority and we're playing on blue side because we have really good openings on blue on red side sorry jesus not blue side we're playing on red side um blue side is actually red side um the top side is the red side okay like the the, the side here this is all red even though it's blue it's not it's not blue in comparison to the context of like 
blue side, red side, or purple side, uh, blue side, right? Um, and so here, in this case, because he has these openings on red side, easy to do dragon, right? Easy to do dragon, because he has priority. If priority didn't exist, he wouldn't be on the dragon. And so because he, he requires priority, we end up also using Q. And so it's unlikely that LNG, or sorry, not LNG, RNG, will end up playing for the dragon. Wukong is most likely on the golems and... Oh, okay, they're actually looking to fight the dragon. This is not going to be good for them. Th this is where they're going to lose because Ari is flanking. Okay, so someone's going to die here. Yep. Okay. So RNG really runs it. Okay, nice. Okay, so I mean again, th this is this is because they just didn't have an angle. They really just did not have an angle. See, it's weird, right? Because this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Think about it in terms of R uh, LNG's perspective. If they don't want to fight, let's assume they don't want to fight. If they don't want to fight, they can just kite the dragon to the north side, like somewhere around this region, and then just pull up and leave. Okay, ADC either bases or he wraps around and keeps laying, whatever. Okay, and if they can win the fight, then they turn it. Then they, they obviously turn it. And so the decision to go for the dragon is really weird. But likewise, what is the alternative? Not going for the dragon. Well, what does not going for the dragon mean? Well, if we don't go for the dragon, Wukong bases, Wukong runs to topside, his blue spawns. Not really going to do anything in topside. Raptors are up. We have some tempo on Raptors. Maybe we end up fighting for Raptors with Nico priority. Because perhaps, let's say, Nautilus ends up walking to Raptors. This is possibly better than attempting to take the Dragon when the possibility of LNG, in this case, just leaving or completely turning it the way they did against RNG. So obviously the latter happens and then RNG gets caught. Very well played, by the way. The uh, Ari charm. I think Ari will die here. Oh, maybe not. Charm, charm, charm. Dude, nice. Okay, the game is over. I mean, that's game ending. The decision not to do this would have been... Well, you could just go for enemy raptors, perhaps, if you have priority. And if you don't, then, I mean, it's better than this. If Even if you don't get Raptors as RNG, then it's still fine. It beats doing this. And so, really, what this was is, is, is a pretty huge flip. So, it ends up uh, showing mid lane for some reason. Because something needs to shove. We're not really sure why Sion is mid. He's trying to fix the wave, and then maybe he DPs top or something. I don't know. Ends up getting plating. Actually, I guess it's like pretty good. That sounded that, huh? He must teleport top, no? Or I guess uh, Nico just ends up going top. I suppose. Yep. Okay, I mean, this is fine too, yeah, sure. And now enemy jungle should be topside. So Wukong should show somewhere topside at this point in the game. It's eight minutes in it, and the tracking has been very consistent. At this point in the game, <clears throat> if you're ahead, by the way, and you know you can win a fight, at this point in the game, as support, you should just move up. Jungle should move up. Mid should move up. You're going to see this a lot in, high, in like higher ELO solo queue. Okay? So, in this case, this is where you can, as a support, move into the into the river. Because this is where Shalu is spawning. Now, had RNG not gone for the dragon, doubled their efforts to base and then play for the opposite side of the lane, because they knew they had lost resources... We can call the dragon loss X. They needed to even it out with Y. But Y wasn't to blindly contest the dragon. Y was to potentially get Shelly 
get prio, get prio. Because, again, there was downtime, temporarily, because dragon is being taken. Because dragon is being taken, there's some downtime, and therefore that downtime is used to get a alternative position. Um, right? <clears throat> and so, unfortunately, they ended up giving three kills away. And, you know, they ended up shifting. Now they're shifting their momentum to the top side, hence you see the ADC here, too. Um, and, uh, ADC will just shove. And so this is also really, really uh, awkward because, uh, you know, so they're losing Shelly. <clears throat> and when they lose Shelly, again, what, the, what are they doing? So, again, this, this is the same concept, right? We're giving up X for Y. But what is Y? When X happens, X is a play. X is a gold, like, uh, this is like plus, you know, X gold. Okay? <clears throat> and Y needs to match that gold. And so instead of playing for Shelly that they assume they don't have an angle for, considering, again, the same, the, well, the same reasons, they don't, they don't have the angle, they don't have the openings as we do on the blue side. Although they can gain priority, they don't have Aphilios here, and so they actually have a lack of numbers. And so contesting X by fighting for this is is would be the same would be the same mistake that RNG just made a few seconds ago on the dragon. So instead, what LNG does is they 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 respond with X with Y, and and Y is really okay. Well, we're gonna go into your jungle because we know it's up, right? We are going to take your jungle, we're going to force anyone out of here, and then we're going to sit right over here so our bottom lane gets free XP and, 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 and gold and items. And that's much better than potentially losing a fight in topside, unless you think you can win it. But you can't because you don't have ADC here, and so you just give it. <clears throat> okay? Ari shows up. Um, I don't think the ward was necessary to take out on topside. I think Ari should just be already moving to the bottom side jungle. And... Now, for RNG to actually get caught in the bottom side and lose summoners is really bad because they know that if LNG isn't looking to contest on X then or and on Shelly, then um, they know that they're they're obviously going to be making play on the opposite side. In this case, you don't want to walk into your jungle, and this is crazy, right? Because <clears throat> this happens even in like Master and Grandmaster solo queue, where people just they know what's coming, but they just still don't acknowledge it. Or they turn their brain off randomly, and they just walk into their jungle. Happens a lot in Diamond 1. It's very, very characteristic of Diamond 1 in solo queue. And even, even in, like, Master. It's a little less in Grandmaster, but, like, it's still, you know, people still do stupid things sometimes. So now we base. Now we don't go into our top side, <clears throat> because we know that enemy jungle is most likely there. Therefore, we give up and we go and we double down our efforts on bottom side, <clears throat> knowing that if Wukong ends up showing, that we'll have information on him because, you know, obviously the uh, the pink ward is there. Now, the only alternative that Wukong can really do if this is up and this is up is he'll just run to bottom like this. And so forcing a bottom play is actually pretty bad if you're in this winning position as bottom lane. we Aphilios is like a level ahead of Jinx. There's a pretty big wave coming in. There's absolutely no reason to dive right now. There's absolutely no reason to like invest anything in bottom, considering Wukong is most likely running like this. And so if Wukong jumps the gun and ganks this lane, then, then the game is really over. But Viego shouldn't gank anyway. Wukong should show. Okay, so he does show. Rakan went all in. Gonna get Nautilus assaulted. Probably gonna get... Uh, oh, it actually lives. And so again, as we discussed, right, like, this was a super int investment on RNG's end because they know where, where Viego should be. And so on the side of LNG, like, if Wukong goes to this, right, if, if Wukong goes to this lane state and then forces the play, it's really bad. Now, obviously, Viego is not prepared. I, I also don't think Viego is really, like, looking forward to... Uh, the affiliates just like ulting and going all in. That's okay. Because the thing is, in a, in a different game, this could mean death, right? Like, yeah, it works out because Rakan is like, you know, it's like support LeBlanc when it comes to mobility. 
Um, but in a different variation, like this can mean death. Jinx is definitely dead if Ari just run. Oh shoot, Nico shows. Come on, come on. Nice. Oh my god, he charmed the right one. Oh, but it doesn't matter. Wait, did he charm the wrong one? No, he charmed the right one. Okay, but it doesn't matter. He still has, he still has R. He'll probably, he'll probably go. Like four seconds. Yep. There we go. Nico's dead. Charm, charm, charm. Nice. Oh my god, survive. Okay, Rakan's dead. Q, Q, Q. Q. Okay. Nice. So really what League becomes is, is a game of trade-offs. But it's very important before you start playing this game of trade-offs to know whether you can win a trade-off or not. This requires time. This requires team cohesion as well. You're not going to have that in low elo. But just because you're in low elo doesn't mean that you shouldn't start thinking about the games in term, terms of higher elo perspectives. Because once you start having those higher level perspective, oh my god, he whiffed the charm. Once you still have uh, still have those higher level perspectives, well then, you, then your play becomes a lot better. Your jungle in like gold and silver and platinum and low diamond or diamond diamond one, you know, let's say he does random three camps and then goes to top side. Well, you're tracking the enemy jungle. Maybe you go as well as a mid laner. Probably you go as a support on Shelly timer more often, right? Like these are things you'll start doing more and more. If you start reading the game more and more just because the game isn't necessarily having it's hard to do this in lower elo because there's less to read because there's more randomization and so theory falls apart when there's more random gameplay but you can still apply this relatively accurately up until lane phase okay and that's really all you need to do because after the lane phase, really, it's just fighting in solo queue, honestly. And then this is this is very this is very um, respective to like every almost almost every rank, really. It's just fighting after solo after after the lane phase, okay. But being able to read the game will allow you to it, it, you'll be able to know what to do with your wave because you'll know what's about to happen. You're assessing things based off of key indications that you're, you're you're slowly learning from these videos right and so we're gonna end up we're gonna end it off here and we'll continue to talk about lane in a more uh detailed version but it's really important we first start reading the paces of the game and then we can start looking at like these small spacing things that these players are doing like these small base timers that they could be getting these small optimizations that will, will will make more sense because eventually you'll start reading the game more so that was it for this video we'll talk a little more in the next coming lessons i'm going to be posting a lot like we'll, we'll be regularly uploading because we have to get through these 100 sessions and we have to do it in a way where we can cover practically everything that there is important to know about League of Legends for us to be able to optimally play solo queue, ultimately increasing our competence and eventually our rank. Okay, anyways, that is it for this video. I will see you guys next time.